welcome those who are in person service as well as those online. Let's come down and be still in His presence and just be still and allow the Holy Spirit to minister and prepare us wherever God's people, God's children are gathered. Whether in the house of God or in the homes of God, wherever God's people recite. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You are welcome, O oh Lord, to speak into our lives, speak into our minds. You are welcome, O oh Lord, to pour forth your grace and your mercy. You are welcome, Lord, to remind us of your goodness, your love and your care, your protection and your provision. The day is gone past. You are welcome to remind us, Lord, of our failings, our shortcomings. May you have done things, Lord, or said things, O Lord, that are not pleasing to you. Please forgive us. Please pour forth, Lord, your grace and your mercy in the fresh outpouring as we prepare our hearts, Lord, to worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So truly, O Lord, as your people gather, we are your family. Whether, Lord, in your sanctuary or in our respective homes, where we dwell, where we stay, we just pray, O Lord, that your presence in our midst will make all that difference. That we know that God is in our midst and we worship a living, heavenly Father. So just invite you, O Lord, to come. Come and commune with your people and we commune with you. Help us, Lord, to lay aside our cares, our worries, our struggles with life our fears, our anxieties. Help us, Lord, to leave them at the feet of your cross and have the freedom and liberty to worship you. Can you uphold, Lord, people in our own nation who may be prevented from worshipping you or gathering with your people. Pray, O oh Lord, that you also will reach out to them that your love and your mercy is just as new and strong in their particular situation. And just pray, O oh Lord, that truly you will also hear their cries. You will also grant them a special touch of your spirit. So as you commit this time to your hands, Lord, pray that your name be exalted. Your name will be lifted high. And together as your people, Lord, together or in our respective homes, there be a resounding chorus of praise before your throne of grace in heaven. We commit this time into your hands. In Christ we do pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin, let's rise. We're going to sing a first song called Living Hope. Now, the Word of God says this. Okay, let's see. If you have put your hope in the Lord, what is the advice of the Word of God? I know time's a bit not the greatest of times, but the Word of God says this, for those who put their hope in the Lord, it says this, be strong and take heart, all who hope in the Lord. Psalms 31, verse 24. Again, I repeat again, Psalms 31, verse 24 says, be strong and take heart for all those who hope in the Lord. So let's sing this first song, A Living Hope, to remind ourselves that our hope is in Jesus. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain? How high, high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, in desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into. Let's sing the first verse again. How great the chasm. How great. 
the castle that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and to the darkness your loving kindness draw to the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written in Jesus Christ my living hope was to who could imagine who could imagine so great a mercy what heart to fathom such countless Christ, on my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. darkness of God. Amen. Good morning, Facebook. Good morning, church. Before we sing the next song, wave to the next person next to you, right? Can we wave? If you're at home, shake your mother's hand, hug your parents' hand. Hello. All about you. Let's declare. You are the Holy One. You are the living word you are the center of my focus jesus you are the son of god you are the solid rock you are the center of my focus jesus you're the lover of my soul and i adore you only it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Jesus, it's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Let's see the first verse again. 
You are the Holy One. You are the Holy One. You are the Living One. You are the center of my focus, Jesus. You are the Son of God. You are the solid rock. You are the center of my focus, Jesus. You're the lover of my soul, and I adore you. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Let's go sing the second verse. You are wonderful, God. Oh yes, Lord. Let's declare. You are miraculous. You are supernatural. You are the center of my focus. Powerful, you are so wonderful. You, you are the center of my focus, Jesus. You're the lover of my soul, and I don't know. Let's declare it all. It's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Let's give it one more time. Jesus, it's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Jesus. Let's declare. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Oh, we declare here. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Oh, 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 oh heaven is in my heart. Let's get a kid of God here. The of our God is here. Heaven is in my heart. The presence of His Majesty. Heaven is in my heart. And in His presence, joys abound. Heaven is in my heart. The light of holiness surround. Heaven is in my heart. Kingdom of our God is here. Heaven is in my heart. The presence of His Majesty. Heaven is in my heart. And in His presence, joys abound. Heaven is in my heart. The light of holiness surrounds. We sing. Heaven, Heaven is in, in my heart. heart. And oh. Them. 
the foundation stone. Heaven is in my heart. He will return, take us. Heaven is in my heart. The spirit and the bride say, Come. He sing, Heaven, Heaven is in my heart. Okay, let's clap our hands. I think when we go up to heaven, it's much more hundred times glorious than this. Hallelujah, God. Amen. Lord, we come now in worship and in surrender to you, God. In times like this, we know, Lord, we need you more than ever before, Lord. So we come and sing this song as a declaration that I'll surrender to you. And once again, to remind ourselves that our lives, our family's lives, our friends' lives, and all those we love, we all need you. Like it's in your hands, our lives in your hands. Oh God. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing in, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Let's sing it again. Lord, I come to you. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Let's declare, Lord, I need. Runs deep. Where sin runs deep, your grace is born. Where grace is found, is where you are. Oh Lord, it's where I want to be. It's where you are. Where you are, Lord, where sin runs deep. Where sin runs deep, your grace is born. Where grace is found, is where you are. Where you are, 
we want to be there. Where you are, let's go. We want to be with you, God. And I am free in holiness. Is Christ in us? Declare, Lord, I need you. Oh, we declare, Lord. Lord, I need you. Oh. One defense of God. You're my one defense. My righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense. My righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Lift up our heads right now. If you have any burdens in your heart, anything to pray for, just lift it up to the Lord. We're just going to take a little time here just to pray and intercede. I know there's no intercession in our program. But we just want to leave this takes time to pray on behalf of anything, whether it's your friends or families in trouble or whether it's our country as well. Just lift it up to your hands. We're going to take a little time just to pray to the Lord. We surrender everything to you, God. We know we cannot do all things without you, God. Forgive us, God. We've tried to do things our way without waiting on you, without your guidance, God. We know that you are in control and we lift up everything to you, God. For you do all things, good things to those who, who love you, God.
Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift. silver and my gold. For first, take my silver.
Good morning. It's nice to be in the house of the Lord to worship Him. Um, before we begin, uh, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we invite your presence in our midst right now. May we glorify your name. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be holy and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The topic for this morning is uh, rules for holy living. It does sound a little legalistic huh? about do's and don'ts, but I want to assure you, it is so much a part of our life. And um, my first picture is to share about an unwritten rule I myself practiced uh, 41 years ago. You notice the picture of fine dining uh, with a couple, and the lady says, it was a nice dinner. What does she mean by that? You see, the unwritten rule is, if you want to propose to a lady, and this is not a lesson in proposal making, there are some unwritten rules. And the unwritten rule is, create an experience of unforgettable moments. I tried doing that with my wife, and I assure you, it did work. Uh, and this is how it goes, not about us, but about the rules. You see, an experience is an accumulation of moments. Do you agree? Memorable moments. The moment, as you can see the words, you arrive, the first taste of the bite of the food are all very memorable, isn't it? Including even going to the bathroom because it is so fragrant, if it is a very nice place, as well as what the waiter says and explains to you the kind of food you are eating. All these are moments, you know. And from the time the first bite takes place till the time you leave, the waiter says, hope to see you again, uh, and calls you by your first name. Don't you agree? The part that I deviated was going to the bathroom because I had stomach ache. It was sheer nervousness about making a proposal. You know. But other than that, it was a memorable moment for both myself and my wife because it resulted in her saying yes. So failure was not an option. Now, the point that I want to make is what are rules? It's a statement of what you are advised to do in a particular situation. It can be a rule or a principle. You can use it interchangeably. The golden rule, which all of you are familiar, is you should treat others in the same way that you want them to treat you. Are you not familiar? Right. So, keep that in mind. A rule or a principle leads you to a certain action or to a certain conduct. And the first uh, definition is from the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary. Now, even our country, and I think you're very familiar with this, has got the Rukun Nagara, called the National Rules or Principles in which we live by. The five key points are before you. I need not read them to you, but let me tell you this. The history of our Rukun Nagara came about against a backdrop of national disaster. If you recollect those of us in the 50s and above in age, May 13, 1969. Remember, there was the racial riots between the major races. There was bloodletting and there was killing. The saddest moments in our nation. And the Rukun Nagara arose by the thinkers of the government. How shall we bring unity to this country? amongst the races, against a backdrop of tragedy. So, the only way they 
our forefathers saw it was to unite around five rules or principles. One is a belief in God. Isn't that a unity point? The second is loyalty to king and country. Isn't that a common rule that all of us agree to? And the third is the supremacy of the constitution. All of us can agree. I don't think there's any argument about it. The rule of law. And finally, courtesy and morality. If we go by these five rules or principles, there will be harmony and peace and no more infighting. And that's why recently, from 1970, 31st August, when it was formed, these five rules, it came alive again today because we were all under threat as a country. And we need to unite against a common body of conduct or rules. So I hope you understand. The memory of these five principles are very important for the unity of the country. And we need to live by it. Of course, the new economic policy came after that, and that is to eradicate economic disparity amongst the races, another flashpoint amongst the races. So long as we understand this, rules can be part of your life for harmony and for peace. And I want to show you another kind of rules. They are called the rules for holy living, and this applies to all of us who are believers. Remember, you understand that the definition of holiness is separation unto God. With that as a definition, therefore, our conduct or behaviour must befit those who are separated unto the Lord. Isn't that right? If God is holy, can we reflect holiness? If God has godliness, godly characteristics, do we therefore reflect godliness in our behaviour and conduct? Easier said than done. But that is the first principle in which we rest our faith or to live out our faith. Having said that, I want to cover three principles which I believe are very important, which you have gone through in your BWJ materials. The first principle is, what is our attitude to sin? The second principle I will deal with later is, how do you deal with temptations and desires? A thing that keeps on facing us daily, weekly, monthly, and perhaps for the rest of our lives. And the third principle is, what are Christian disciplines? These are the three principles I hope to share with you. Now, the first principle, what is our attitude towards sin? Luke 15, 18 says, The returning prodigal son said, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And even King David said, Against thee, thee only have I sinned. You notice a very interesting statement by the prodigal son. I have sinned against heaven and against thee. There is sin at the heavenly level and there's sin at the earthly level. A realisation on the depth and gravity of sin. Most of us are brought up to say we must have victory over sin. It seems right. We have no argument against that. But how many of us realise that our sins grieves God? breaks the heart of God. And that is what we should be focusing on, not just victory over sin. Victory over sin is a consequence. But even the prodigal son says, I grieve God. King David also says, I grieve God. Think about the heart of God that hurts and breaks when we sin. So, my next point is, the hyper-grace believers or they belong to the school of abundant grace or super grace, they say, with faith, there's abundant grace. Galatians 2.20, Romans 6.14. You can check those verses. And it will continually wash away our sins. And hence, you only repent once. Subsequently, you don't repent again. I have to say this because it hits fundamentally our doctrine of sin and grace. It brings an entitlement uh, attitude and mental perception that 
Should I sin? I just, God is obliged to wash away my sins. Is that a right attitude to sin? Fundamentally, we have to deal with this struggle. Eh? And that is where I want to bring to you the parable of the prodigal son, where I ask the question, is there a need for repentance? I think the whole argument is, you only repent once, you don't need to repent again. But look at the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, and you can read it in your Bible. Let's get the context right. Jesus Christ was talking about three parables, the parable of the lost sheep. Remember the one sheep that went astray and the 99 that stayed on? How the shepherd went high and low to look for that one lost sheep. The parable of the lost coin, where the widow lost one coin, and when she found it, and she would rejoice and celebrate it. And now the prodigal son, the lost son. So it's a theme about lostness. You know? Very interesting theme about lostness in these three parables. That's the context. I don't have to repeat, but you learn this in Sunday school as well as in your quiet time. The younger son of the two sons in the parable of the prodigal son was an abuser of grace. Let me tell you that. Why? He asked for property from his father before he died. What a terrible thing to do, isn't it? Normally, inheritance is passed down after death. But while the father is alive, he's treating the father like dead. That's an abusing of grace. He came from a very good environment, but decided to cash out and go to a far country, spend in high living. Sinful ways are very attractive. You get high living, enjoy life, but the time of reckoning will come. When a great famine came, he was reduced to nothingness because he spent all the wealth away. And he was feeding pigs with pots. And he even said, I wish I could eat the pots that the pigs are eating. Can you imagine the kind of destituteness of sin? And Christ was telling us, sin is like that. It brings us down to the level of destitution, where we lose our self-worth, our whole being. Look at that man. But from an abuser of grace, he went into saving grace, whereby his senses came back to him. Interesting, isn't it? When will sense come back to us? And he says, even the servants of my father's house are living better than the state I'm in. I will be contented to be a servant and not to be a son. You see, the humility of repentance begins to come in because senses have been knocked into his head. Have we reached that level of recognizing sin? And he decided, I will go back to my father. And you know the rest of the story, the rejoicing and all that. That's the prodigal son, who is the abuser of grace, became the recipient of grace through a realization. Do we all realize it and not behave like we don't need repentance? You see the difference? But I want to share you something more interesting, is that this, the elder son, you see the picture there, stood a distance in the picture. And I always wondered why, you know, because we are all the time focusing on the younger son. The elder son saying, Father, I'm very angry. Why you treat him with such special treatment? I've been with you all the time. Now, superficially, doesn't that sound right? In fact, there emerges a second prodigal son. Why? Because he says, I don't need to get involved. I'm very angry. I reject. And the father says, look, he was lost but I'm found. He was dead but I'm alive. Will you not rejoice with me? Do you know that Jesus Christ was hitting at two groups of people, the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, like the younger son. But there also, we have to watch out. The elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, who behave like the elder son. So in this world, there are two prodigal sons in my mind and interpretation. One abused grace but realized he's wrong and came back. Are we going to be in that category? That's the challenge. 
Or do we say, we are right? I'm a fine Christian. I come from a Christian home. I'm a Methodist for three generations. I've done nothing wrong like murder, killings, robbery. But your faith is a very different kind of faith. You are holding traditions, inheritance of religiosity, but not touching the heart. You see the difference. So, it is really a story of lostness. When will you return back? And that invitation is for both sons, interestingly. So, what is our attitude to sin? This is one key point. The next is, we do struggle with temptations and desires, isn't it? I want to ask you a question, and I don't know whether you wish to answer. Is temptation a sin? Some will probably say yes, some will say no. But temptation actually leads to sin. Um, you see the two pictures, the Garden of Eden and the wilderness. I call it from the garden to the wilderness. Let's look at Mark 14.38, where the Garden of Gethsemane scenario begins to unfold. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You notice Peter, James, and John were with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was struggling over his crucifixion, sweating, tear, uh, uh, sweats of blood, you know. And says, can you not watch one hour with me? And they fell asleep. Second time, third time. They just couldn't keep awake. The temptation of sleepiness overrides prayer. Sounds very familiar, isn't it? Because many times I prayed and I found myself asleep. So, okay, that's called the Garden of Gethsemane effect. No, that's a joke. But what I'm saying is, it goes to show our flesh takes over many times. And that's why we keep on falling back, falling back, and falling back. Don't you agree? Think about it privately yourselves and do it before the Lord. What can be done about it? That's one. Desires and temptations seem to go together. Don't you agree? Besides the struggle about dealing with temptations. Because without temptations, temptations rather arouses desires. They come as a pair. Watch out. So in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, and now I come to the garden. Do you know the modest operandi of Satan? He will be very subtle. He does it in a very secret way because sins always originate from something secret. Do you agree? It is between you and in that privacy of the darkness. He says, is it true that you should not eat any of the fruits of the tree in the garden? He starts with a lie, but a very subtle lie, using facts mixed with lie. And Eve says, uh, you can uh, eat any except for the tree in the middle of the garden, right? And then he says, you will not die. Another lie upon a lie begins to come in. You see how lying becomes a way of deception. And Eve says, Eve also fell into the trap. He says, uh, you cannot eat that tree in the middle of the garden because even if you touch it, you will die. Now, is that the truth? You see, the subtleness of lying begets lie. You cannot stop the cycle of lies. And the temptation begins to grow because, notice in what I say, Genesis 3, 6 in particular, the food was good to eat, first point. Then I call it the lust of the flesh begins to come in. It was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. And you can be like God himself, the God's status. I call it the pride of life. You notice the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life begins to creep in. All three sins, categories of sin, begin to weave its way, and finally, the first Adam fell. You know that story. But I'm so impacted by the wilderness now. 
looks very ugly compared to the Garden of Eden, where the moment at the River Jordan when Christ was baptized by John the Baptist and the heavens opened and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, do you realize the Spirit drove him into the wilderness? Why so? To me, it's a very strange event to take place. Driven into the wilderness to go for 40 days and 40 nights without food as a fast, and the end result was Jesus was very hungry. The humanity of Christ. And that's where you come and see Satan in those moments of seeming weakness, you know. But the Son of God went in nevertheless, and he confronted Satan face on. And that's a very interesting thing that I find, a very interesting event that will impact all our lives because Satan likes to operate in hiding. Christ says, you come out of your hiding. I'm going to deal with you. Isn't that the greatest comfort for us? Christ has battled on our behalf. And he says, and Satan, no choice but to throw three temptations like the Garden of Eden. The first was, if you are the son of God, turn the stones into bread. That is the lust of the flesh, repeated from the Garden of Eden, which is called the first temptation, dealing with the bodily desires. And Christ quoted scriptures. The second temptation is, he put him on the high pinnacle in the temple and says, if you jump down, the Lord will surely save you. Just do not tempt the Lord your God. That is the pride of life, egoism, where power display and power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton says that. That was in display and Christ, and, he quote, and Satan can quote scriptures and Christ counteract. You see the battle of temptations and resistance. And the last one was on a high mountain where all the kingdoms were displayed. If you bow down and worship to me, that is the last of the eyes. Wealth, riches, materialism. Aren't we facing all these three in today's society? It has not changed. But Christ has gone before us, resisted it, point blank defeated Satan, and we have victory there. The last Adam fought on our behalf. And I want to comfort you with that. So factually, you know this, but how do you practice this out? And that's the key thing. But let me put a caveat. If you cannot fight like the way Christ or resist, please flee. And Genesis chapter 39, verse 12, talks about Joseph and the wife of Potiphar. Remember? Potiphar's wife was tempting him. Please and come and lie down with him. And you know, Joseph said something very interesting in verse 12 of Genesis 39. I shall not sin against my master and I shall not sin against God. Again, the dual effect was there. The human master and the divine master. He was fully aware. How nicely we can remind ourselves this way when we go into sin or tempted into sin. He ran for his life. I'm not suggesting that when you see a beautiful woman, you should run for your life. But Joseph did what he called, instead of fight, he flee. So nothing wrong in fleeing. The only mistake he did was to leave his garment behind. So next time in, when you're in a hurry, please pack your clothes properly. But that's not the message of the Bible. The, the issue is, if you cannot fight, you flee. For those of us who feel we are losing the battle. So, I think the greatest comfort is the first Adam fell in the garden, but it was the last Adam that won the victory in the wilderness. Until today, we have that protection and that strength in him. Now, my third principle is Christian disciplines. Second Timothy 3.16 talks about all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But remember this very nice sentence to recite, but it carries a lot of weight. First of all, can God breathe 
into the scriptures and into your life first before you can consider teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. That is the consequence. But the process is we need the breath of God in our life, breathing in and inspiring us. And scripture has that quality. So my suggestion is we need to have daily habits. The daily intake of the word of God we need to set aside planned time and a planned method. Does that make sense? We need that discipline. It will not just come. Even when you exercise, you need the discipline of exercise to lose weight, uh, to do your stretches, whatever. And when I was young, I really owe a lot to a planned method, and that's called the Scripture Union Bible Reading Method. I know En Su has been talking about Bible engagement and deep dive. Those are more modern versions of Scripture Union, but the good old-fashioned Christian Union method consists of five steps or five areas of focus. Pray, you pray before you read, and then you read, you reflect, you apply, what, what you reflect, and then you pray again, five steps. But that was a good first start. And then as I reflected upon reflect, the word reflect in italics, point number two, I realized reflect means ruminate. Have you heard of this English word ruminate? Therefore, a person who ruminates is called a ruminant. Interesting word. To reflect or ruminate is the, the key part of the five steps. Without going through that, you will miss a lot. Because if you want scripture as God breathe, is where the reflection or ruminate is the heart of the matter. You look at the main point. What is the main point of the passage you are reading for today? What is God revealing? What insights do I get? And what is required of me now, whether in thoughts, word, or action, he will speak to us as clearly as the sun rises and or the moon sets. So, reflection or ruminate. And then I went to search the word ruminate. It says, chew the cut, internalizing his word in a deeper way. It becomes part of you. Now, that takes time and effort and really coming into the presence of God. Now, I was a little bit insulted when I saw the word chew the cart. Only the cows and the sheep and goats chew, you know. Is scripture you then asking me to be like the cow? That didn't sound very nice. Then I realized scripture union method is teaching me to be not to be a cow, but to be like the cow. Doesn't make a difference. So what is it to be like the cow and not to be the cow? Most of us read scriptures like the cow. And we don't process very much. What goes in comes out. I call it wastage. That's called the cow. To be like the cow is a big difference. Let me show you what I mean. Now, if you look at the stomach of the cow, there are four chambers. The biggest chamber is called the rumen. Can you see it? That's where the word ruminate comes from. So really, we have to be like the cow. You know? And what does it mean to be like the cow? The, the, you see, a cow or a sheep, if you look at them, they are spending all their time eating, isn't it? Eating grass. Do you realize that? I say, what a waste of life, you know. But for some people, it's a way of life. Like. But I'm talking about the cow. It keeps on eating non-stop. Then I realize, oh, the biggest chamber in the stomach is called the rumen. And there's about 50 gallons in a healthy cow. What a capacity. Do you realize that it goes round and round within the rumen and goes back to the esophagus for the cow to re-chew again? So what goes in comes out, chew, goes in, come out, chew a few times before it goes to the reticulum. And it's in the reticulum that the stones and the metal are caught by that narrow orifice there. It goes to the obesum and the abomasum. Okay, don't worry about the technical part. Lah. The last chamber of the stomach is one of the smallest. You notice that. So there's a lot of food 
being digested and revolving with digestive juices in the rumen before it goes to the other chambers and where the greatest nutrients are absorbed in the last chamber, the abomasum. And when that happens in the fourth chamber, a healthy cow begins to produce good, rich milk. And I say, wow, the Lord is teaching us to chew the cud. Don't rush through your reading. It takes a lot of reflection, internalizing, in order for you to be able to sanctify or make holy your thoughts, words, and action. That is the milk that the cow produces, the best parts, the nutrients, because it's properly chewed in the four chambers of the stomach. So, are you willing to chew the cut when you, when you read your Bible? Or are you rushing as a matter of duty? If so, time for confession. So, Bible reading is not just reading or speed reading. It is chewing the cut. Is that clear? Okay. So, I want to conclude. Unless our attitude to sin is correct, unless our spiritual disciplines are in place, and unless we deal with temptations and desires, how can we practice holiness in an unholy world? See the point there? We need to get our basics right. In the book of John 17, 15, is, Christ has given us a very interesting prayer. My prayer is that it's not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. In short, Christ has put, here, put us here on earth for a reason. And if you read further in that verses, Christ says, As you send me, so I send my disciples to the world. So we have a function and a duty and a calling from the Lord. And what is that calling about? And that calling is about how Jesus answered them. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. We are called to minister to the sick. And I don't mean physically sick, the emotionally sick, the spiritually sick, the morally sick. And I have not to come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. So our role is about the sinners and the sick. That's why we are here on this earth. We have been called to live in this world, to practice holiness in an unholy world. And if you look at Sunday, Monday to Saturday, Sunday is 24 hours. We popularly call it our day of rest. May I use the word holy day? But most of us take it as a holiday. So can you now convert a holiday to holy day? Why? In that 24 hours, of which two hours are in this church, is meant for us to be gathered together as the body of Christ, mutually encouraging one another. And for the rest of the day, ruminate, reflect, chew the cut, because God rested on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, He made it holy. And that's where He was delighted with the six days. The seventh day, to review the six days of what have you been doing as a calling of God. That's why from Monday to Saturday, which is 144 hours, there is what we call a gathering on Sunday, like what we are doing here online or as well as in person, and then we are dispersed out Monday to Saturday. Do you see the rhythm of life? And that's the rhythm of life that God has created for us a gathering and a dispersal, rest, recreation, and then work. You see, that rhythm of life is a reality in us. And Jesus himself spent an inordinate amount of time in the marketplace or the public square. He was with the sinners, the tax collectors, the widows, and the sick. Am I right? How much time does he spend in the synagogue? You know? So, but that is why Christ retains us here on earth to spread out. But again, to come back to the sanctuary here to be refreshed. So we have that spiritual rhythm. 
And I want to show you, we shouldn't look, therefore, on a traditional perception of the hierarchy of occupations, right? Number one, I always say they only die once, huh? martyrs. Uh, number one to number 12. Most holy, semi-holy, less holy, most unholy. That's not right in looking at, even though right now I can't help feeling about politicians. Uh, but there is a calling even to be there. What is more important is this diagram. The same 12 occupations now going horizontally. That means we work with our pastors, our pastoral staff, hand in hand to go out to society, to minister, to heal, to pray. So here it is. Uh, easier for you to see in blue what is in green and to bring, back, bring them back to the sanctuary. You understand? That is the kind of teamwork that we need to have. We all go out and march out to society together come Monday tomorrow. That is my encouragement to you. So, in the light of this, I want to conclude. In order for us to be the salt and the light of the world, because how salty are we and how bright are we? That, I think, is a question we need to ask ourselves. And with that, I want to encourage you and may every blessing go to each one of you as you move from the sanctuary to the public square and the marketplace, bearing in mind the three key principles and then coming back on Sunday to share, to pray and to encourage one another. God bless you all. Thank you. Truly, just thank God for His Word, just to encourage us even to live life that are worthy and holy unto our God, who is holy. The main reason why we need to be holy because our God is holy and He desires for His own children, you and I, to also be holy. So I think that's key to all that we want to do and experience in the Lord's presence. We are close, remain standing, and those online, let's close the song, Living Hope, that we sang when we opened the worship. Living Hope. How great the castle that lay between us, how high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared a grave has no claim on. to give the benediction. Let's all pray. Thank you, Lord, that you call us to be holy as you are holy. Amen. We thank you that it is not about us, but it is about you. And you call us to be like you because you have made us in your own image. And we are thankful. And Lord, even as your word encourages us to work out our salvation, with fear and trembling. It is with this in our hearts that we say thank you. It's not about us knowing how to work it out, but your word says that God is at work in us to will and to act according to your good purpose. Help us, Lord, to always be aligned to your good purpose in every situation. Even as we have come and entered to worship, we depart here to be a blessing and to serve you. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the amazing fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us now until we see Jesus face to face. And we all say together, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you. God bless.